Thank you, Aaron, for that intro. Hello, hello, everybody. Like Aaron said, my name is Franz Morris, and I'm super excited to be here today. I have a hopefully a great presentation for you, and I'm going to get through these, but I'm going to save time for us to have questions at the end. So let's get this started. I'm going to share my screen, and let's rock and roll. So <clears throat> today, I'm going to talk about growth design in 2021. And it's an interesting topic that is passionate to me and dear to me because I am a growth designer, but I'll walk through what growth design is and how I got started in it. So how's everybody doing today? Like, I know I can't see your response, but you can put it in the chat if you want. I'm going to say I'm more here, the party emoji, because I'm really happy to be here. So I'm probably like a mixture of these two, but more this one because I'm just so excited to be here. So feel free to put in the chat how you're uh, doing and I'll look at that in a second. So uh, I'm Alfonso, but I go by Fonz. I'm lead product designer for global conversion at Netflix. I'm a self-taught designer, actually. I've been in design for about 15 plus years. I've been in product for almost 13. I've started two companies. I've worked at Coursera, which is a ed tech company, which is also dear to me because I just believe education is the key. That's why being here talking to students is one of my favorite things to do. I've worked at Comcast. I've worked in a video game company, personal finance. I was an art director at Def Jam. I worked uh, on ESPN, also some major design agencies out of New York City. And all of this stuff has just been organic, honestly. I I, in my senior year of college, my university opened up a computer lab that I pretty much moved in. It was a state-of-the-art lab that was all, all the brand new Mac, brand new PC, multimedia equipment, cameras, laptops to check out, music studio, whatever you needed to try to learn the skills to build a multimedia career. And I just taught myself everything I could possibly think of, every skill that I would be able to create value to be able to charge somebody for my services. And that ended up allowing me to start a design agency. And from there, I just kept going and going and growing to now being at Netflix. And it's a dream come true. So today, I want to talk a little bit about Netflix. I want to do an intro into growth design. I want to talk about a test that I launched at Netflix. I'm going to give you a couple of takeaways and then hopefully leave some room for questions at the end. So what is Netflix? I know a lot of people know it, but some people may not. So it's better if I just give like a little intro. So Netflix is a streaming service that offers a wide variety of award winning TV shows, movies, anime, documentaries, and more on thousands of Internet connected devices. And you can add another comma on there for video games because we're getting into the video game space as well. So a few stats about Netflix. We have over 209 million total subscriber base. We're available for streaming in over 190 countries. Our content is available and our product is available in over 33 different languages. And worldwide, we have over 13,612 titles. Now, all of those titles are not available to one specific country. I want to be clear about that because of licensing and things of that nature, but that 13,600 is our whole catalog. So what is my job? That's what a lot of people ask me. So what does being lead product designer on global conversion even mean? So global conversion is, is pretty much the growth team, but I'm focused on our global user subscribers, not just specifically North America or South America or EMEA or Asia, but literally all of those markets I and my team focus on. So we just hit our 200 million subscriber mark at the end of the year. And our next goal is 500 million. So that's how my team spends our time trying to figure out where are these next 300 million users going to actually come from. Another piece of clarity that I want to give you is the product team at Netflix is split into non and former member and member, right? So most of the people who are familiar with Netflix 
only know of the member side because that's where you actually go to watch the movies. That's where the player is. That's where the, the box art is. And that's what we call Lola Mo, which is our list of movies and your account settings. But I'm on a team that's actually focused on non and former members. And why is that? Because those are the people who we're trying to convert to actually become paid subscribers. And we're also focused on former members because a lot of Netflix subscribers, they leave for various reasons, financial, their, their favorite show isn't showing anymore, but they end up coming back. So our users are, so our subscribers are split about 60, 40, 60 new users and 40 former members. So my team focuses on catering to those users and the areas that we cover are netflix.com, on the web, mobile devices and TV, as well as the signup flow. So when you put your email, your password and you give your billing information, that's all my team. And that's really important because we're the ones responsible for helping Netflix continue to grow while our member team is focused on constantly providing that amazing user experience that keeps people loving us and constantly paying at the end of every month, to be honest with you. So I want to do a little intro into growth design and a great definition that I have is a process at the intersection of growth, which is the scientific method to improve business metrics and design a human centered process used to solve problems. So if this was like growth and this is like design, that little piece in the middle where they overlap, that's growth design. And it's not that growth design is so much different than product design. It's just what we focus on is different. I'm always gonna focus on good UX and I'm always gonna focus on making sure that I solve the user's problem because I think that's my job at the core. But I'm also very focused on the metrics and the results of the features and the products that we roll out. So, uh, a couple differences between the two is a lot of the work that I do is based on data, not assumptions. And also because I work at Netflix, which is a company that is very data driven and very testing focused, we have the data to be able to help me make the decisions. Now, I still do the designs, but I use the data to help me make a better, more informed decision about the designs. I'm also very, very focused on the user. I'm not focused on myself anymore because if in my beginning years of my career, I was honestly selfishly focused on myself because I was still trying to find myself as a designer and still get my confidence up. So as long as it looked good at the end of the day and people said it looked good, I considered that as a success. Now I'm less focused on what I think about it and more focused on did I actually solve the problem for the user? So that's why I say more user, not designer focus. We continuously iterate on ideas, which this next test case I'm gonna speak about, I'll show you that as opposed to previous design styles was more waterfall where you just did everything and you just learned at the end and you hope you got it right. And if you didn't go off a cliff, then good, you know? But now what we do is we set a lot smaller milestones and we do a lot more testing, which allows us to iterate on things and feel a little more confident about the decisions we make because we didn't rush into it or we didn't put all our eggs in one basket, which ties into the fourth one about being flexible and agile where we're always making changes. I'm working on a project right now that is so massive, but I've got to be honest, every two weeks, it's a, it's a new change to the project that you just have to deal with because as you learn and you grow, you get more information and that should help you make the decisions. And then lastly, we take fewer risks because we spend so much time on the testing that by the time we roll something out, we're very, very confident as a team and as a company because we've already did a lot of qualitative research and quantitative research and user research before and testing. So we're really confident in what we roll out and that's what allows us to, to have such a strong product with such a strong brand, which is really important because you know we have a lot of competitors. So we have to make sure that we always have that edge on our competitors and that's us having just such a solid product. So what does my growth team look like? 
there's product designers, there's product and program managers, content designers, design ops, data scientists, engineering, localization, algorithms, and then around all of that is our communications and our legal team. So my team is actually built of almost about 70 people and each of us are focused on different areas. It's a very collaborative environment and it's amazing when you see all of us come together and we start plugging all of our pieces together and we end up building this amazing product that you just could not build by yourself or with one of these teams. So really excited and proud to be on a team that is this, that can just work this well. Even when you think about remotely, I started Netflix right after the coronavirus. So I haven't met most of these people in person, but that hasn't stopped us from building the relationships that we need to get the job done. I'm really big on communication. Communication is really important in design. So you have to be able to know how to talk to people, explain things, be a good listener, and build these relationships, whether it's in person or over virtual. So I just wanted to give you this, this type of architecture of what my team looks like. Now, every Monday, we have a massive meeting with all of us, we come together. That's about Actually, sometimes it's up to 90 people, but that's our team meeting where you need to make sure all parts of the team are aligned. That's not on all the, at least the micro details, but at least from a higher level, you want everybody to be aware of what's going on. And, and now we break off into our own teams and, and focus on smaller details, but we do have this bigger meeting on Mondays where we all get together. And it's so amazing because I'm constantly learning because I'm hearing from each one of these teams tell me more about the Netflix product. And it's just fantastic. So I want to tell a story about a growth experiment that I was a lead on. It took about two years to complete. And from this experience, there are three attributes that I want to really focus on. We don't do anything at Netflix without a hypothesis. We, that's the starting point of every idea at Netflix for the growth team. Testing is we, I've ran more tests at Netflix than I have in my whole career because we have the resources to, but also a lot of the companies that I previously worked on, they haven't relied on data as much. Small side note, Every Netflix user is in some form of a test. Now you can opt out of the test. So this is not like an invasion of your privacy. It's just more of this is how we can drop little things into the experience and get feedback from you guys and learn what works and what doesn't. So that's just how important testing is for us. And then lastly, the results, because I'm a growth designer and I'm worried about the business strategy. I'm worried about the business impact that these designs and that these products that we create have. So I'm gonna discuss those as well. And let's get started. So a little bit of Netflix lingo for you, VOTV on NMHP update. What does that stand for? So video on TV on non-member homepage update. So, Let's start with the hypothesis. So this is this screen that you're looking at. This is what we call the non-member homepage. And this is the experience that you have on a TV before you log in. So now most of you probably don't remember even seeing this screen because somebody logged into Netflix for you a long time ago. But this is our one of our most important pieces of real estate because this is the first screen you see as a new user who has not signed up for Netflix or if you're a returning former member. We hadn't updated this page in about 10 plus years because it worked, honestly. It, it gave enough information for you to kind of know what Netflix was and it showed you an, enough of the artwork in the back for you to kind of figure you can watch movies here. But when you think of, like I said, 13,000 movies, this, this here is roughly maybe 50. Now we can update this and things of that nature, but as a team, we just felt if we're trying to get to this 300 million, find these new 300 million users, we just didn't know if this static page was doing it anymore. So we came up with this hypothesis that video is the most compelling medium to pitch Netflix to non-members. 
by communicating what's unique and compelling about Netflix in a short video that will be able to answer prospective members' questions, drive more interest, and improve signup rates. So this is the reason why we updated this. So this is what I want you to try to get, like I'm trying to give you a inkling into how growth design things, where it wasn't just, oh, this is, oh, we want to update this, we could do something better. We had to actually tie it to something. And we really feel that by updating this property, we can increase signup rates, which ultimately leads to revenue. And revenue is what businesses are in business for. So after we decided on this hypothesis, the next question is, how do you actually do this? Like, what does it take to get this built? So the next stage is the ideation stage. So as a team, we brainstormed five possible directions we could explore for the video. Each concept had pros and cons, but we were, we were and I was most focused on scalability, effectiveness, inclusivity, and an easy to update asset. So we came up with five concepts and we mapped each one of the concepts to one of our value props because our value props is what we use to sell the company. So one direction was something for everyone. Another one was unlock Netflix. Another one was anytime, anywhere. Another one was freedom. And the last one was this is Netflix. So each of these five, they also had a different theme to them where one of them was heavy animation. One of them was light animation. One was live action. One was scripted with actors. And I'll tell you about another one that we added on later. So because at a company like Netflix, you have the resources, you want to be as creative as possible, but you can't have five concepts or five videos. So now you got to start figuring out, well, how do you scale this down? So we did some qualitative research and we went to Florida and to Palm Springs and we tested the five concepts on 10 different consumers that were varied Netflix users. Some were heavy Netflix users, some were light Netflix users. And I think there were maybe one or two who didn't have Netflix at all. And the goal was to get some, some real honest user feedback from them on which of these directions worked for them and which of these directions maybe didn't work for them. This was so important to us because you would think a company like Netflix would immediately go for let's just use the content that we have and just make something. I mean, we have 13,000 videos. Can we just chop something up and put it together? But uh, it gets way more deeper than that as soon as you really start thinking about things. So from the results of the qualitative research, we, we've we realized that people didn't really want to see the live action. It didn't really work that well for selling what Netflix was. Some people thought the storytelling concept to be kind of polarizing. Some people even thought one of the concepts was kind of creepy and pushing, pushy and annoying. Um, and we realized that uh, we should probably steer away from the actors because the actors in the live action would take too long to produce. It wasn't scalable. When you start thinking about content, if you're gonna pull from our content or if you're going to pick our actor, how are you gonna be able to pick somebody that that is exciting to the whole planet? And that's the thing about when you're trying to build an inclusive product, you don't wanna just create a video that is exciting to US viewers. You wanna create a product that's exciting to everybody. So trying to find that actor or actress or piece of content that would just always resonate with, with uh, 200 million people potentially 500, it was just, we started to realize that that might not be the best way to go. And we also learned that people really wanna see how much content we have. The breadth of content is really important to them as well as the value props. So now we're starting to get enough information to help us scale from those five, which were all amazing down to three. And like I wanna say, we do a lot of extensive uh, qualitative, quantitative research on Netflix. We do a lot of surveys. We do a lot of focus groups. We do a lot of um, user calls. I'm actually in some now. This morning was for Czech Republic. It was eight hours. Tomorrow is Czech Republic. 
early this week it was Peru and last week it was New Zealand. So we're constantly talking to our customers to make sure that we're building this inclusive product that works for everybody and not just only being designers out in Silicon Valley and in New York that are staying in that bubble. We're really trying to make sure that we build experiences for the planet. So with the data from all of this, we were able to get to these four, well, to these three final concepts, phase four iteration. So concept B was the heavy animation that showed the breadth of content. Concept E also showed a little bit of content, but it focused pre predominantly on the value props. And then even though we decided against a live action or an actor video, we still felt maybe we should try a version that uses our content because we have so much. It was almost as if our team had an emotional connection to the content. And we really just thought that that may be a good idea. So what we decided to do was we produced these three concepts, but instead of us just picking one, we actually put them into a test. And this is where, like I, I explained before, where growth design is a mixture of business strategy and impact mixed with product design, because instead of us just saying, well, concept B looks better or concept Z is cheaper to produce or concept E seems more clear, we want to let the people decide for us. So here's an inkling into what testing at Netflix looks like. Sorry to get so technical, but I really want to give you, give true access to what it looks like. So we decided to run a test, right? And this test had eight cells and each of these. So control is what's ever live in production. That's what you have now. And then everything after that, you're testing against that to see, is it better? So remember, we had three options. So we tested concept B, concept E, and concept Z. But then we also tweaked a little bit to concept Z. And then we had one more cell called the secondary control where we didn't update the video, but we changed the button style. So you see things get very complicated when you think, oh, let's just create a new video for Netflix and just chop it up and put it out. It's like, no, there's two years worth of work to get through this. So some test logistics, the population, we tested this actually globally. We don't usually test that big, but because this was such a massive rollout, we actually did a, a global test. We usually pick maybe four to five smaller countries so we can get the data back, but we really need to know whether this video worked or not. And our primary metric was user signups and realized revenue. So after we set this test up, I think we allocated about a million people into this test because we have so much traffic, it's not hard for us to get allocations as it is for a smaller company. So about a million people got into this and the winner of this was option B. So even though we thought option Z, which had the live, which had the content that we thought we could really get an advantage on like using Stranger Things or Tiger King or option uh, E, which was, what people had been used to seeing and kind of simple, it was option B that checked all the boxes for us. Remember, people still had questions when they come to Netflix. So we built this video to be able to answer all those questions. We built this video to be able to show all the different genres that we have, as well as some technical features. And in the back, we're constantly showing you different thumbnails, which allows us to check the box of always showing the breadth of content. This was a winner with a 2.5% sign up and a 2.6 realized revenue lift, which would ultimately lead to about a $30 million a year incremental revenue increase. So it was a massive win for us, but the project is not even close to being over yet because I wanna explain a little bit about the details of the video. So all of the text that you see on the screen right now can be localized to any of those 33 countries. Also, all of the thumb art that you see in the back, that also can be localized to wherever the viewer is, is watching Netflix from. So the content in the back 
is pulled from a database that is based off of what's popular in that region. And then the text that you see is localized to whatever you have your default setting to. And this is all tied into a massive backend visual content engine tied into our massive database. So this also checks the box of being super scalable because remember, this video might not be updated for like another five, six years, maybe 10 years. So we needed it to be able to have everything interchangeable whenever we want. We can literally go in and change all of these thumbnails. We can change one of these thumbnails, but the part that also makes it so amazing is we don't need any designers to do this. And see, that's when you start going to that next level of design where it's not about you want to create things to replace a designer, but as being the original designer on this, it was so tedious to try to grab these thumbnails. I had to set this up in a way where it would be scalable for me or whoever the next designer that would be working on this is to update this. And we did. So now all of this is tied into the back end. It can be updated whenever we want. It's out live in, in the world. If you want to see it, you can log out of Netflix and when it loads back up, you'll see it. But I'm going to give you a sneak peek today. Don't worry. And the last piece I want to talk about is when we were producing this video, we got to the last stage of it. And it was, well, what's the audio going to be for this? And we originally had a voiceover reading all of the text that you saw. But that started to get very complicated when you think of, remember, we have 33 languages. So does that mean that we're going to have to have 33 translations of this? That's going to take a lot of time. That's going to take a lot of work logistically to find 33 people. And then another complex layer on top of this is, are you going to use a male or a female voice for this? Now you're kind of getting out of my lane of growth and getting into brand and making the decision of, what do you want the voice of Netflix to be? That's a very, very difficult decision to make. And that's a, that's a very risky decision to make as well. So while we're trying to decide, and I was about to send the email to get the process started for all of these 33 languages. And one of my backend engineers in the meeting says, do we really even need a voiceover? And everybody got quiet and was like, what are they talking about? But then we started to think to ourselves, do we really need the voiceover? Because if you have the text on the screen that explains everything you need, and you have the thumbnails, you've checked all these boxes, you now have to start thinking about edge cases or user cases where, what if the user has this volume down, it's muted, or it's loud music playing, or something else is going on to where they may not be able to hear it. So you can't depend on the voiceover that much. So we actually, at the last minute, like I said, I was about to send an email to get all the, the voiceovers produced. We actually contacted our internal audio team and we produced an audio track to go on top of the video to replace the voiceovers. And we did not produce the voiceovers. So we saved hundreds of thousands of dollars and months of time. And we were still able to hit our rollout date easily because we did not have to worry about these voiceovers. So that was so interesting that this happened at the 25th hour and it wasn't even from a designer. But I always tell this because this is how collaborative of an environment we are as a team, where I will take feedback from an engineer, a product manager, data scientist, it doesn't matter. As long as you're helping me build the best product that I can build, I want your feedback. So let me switch this over now to the actual video and you can tell me what you think. Let's go.
So that's the video. And I want to give some key takeaways and then I want to open up the floor for questions. So always remember, user empathy is key. Build what your users want, not what you want, because I'm not watching that video. The new users are watching that video. So I can make something that I like, but I need to ultimately make sure this is what the user wants. Make sure that I solve their problem at the end of the day. Data is your friend. You can use it to help drive design. Do I feel like I still get to be creative at work? For sure. I don't feel like I just design only what the data says, but I feel as if the data helps me make a better informed design and that ends up being a more successful design. I know some of you, maybe you'll wanna work at a big company like Netflix, maybe you'll work at a startup, wherever you end up, always try to test things. You don't have to always make assumptions. Sometimes you will, but testing really allows you to kind of get an idea before you put all your eggs in one basket. So you can like do little tests, you can do little A-B tests. Your tests don't have to be as, like as big as the one that I showed, which is eight cells, but don't don't feel afraid to test things out. It's just part of design. Inclusive products make users happy. When people open up a product that they feel is made for them, whether it's you've updated the languages, you've shown content from their area, or you've updated the language on the box art to a local language that they can read, people notice those things and that makes them feel more at home that makes them feel welcome from the product and that makes them want to use it and that's what you want at the end of the day and lastly always be lean and resourceful that's why i told the story about the engineer who said don't even have the voiceover and like i said that saved us hundreds of thousands of dollars in hours and hours of man hours as well as the time that it would have took to get that stuff built so all of these are just slight takeaways I want you to, to, to try to remember. But one major takeaway is have fun with design. I'm lucky enough to be in a position to still love what I do every day that I get up and go to work. It's been a long road, but it's been worth it. Um, I wouldn't want to be doing anything else. And I'm glad that my career has allowed me to do things like this, where I can come and talk to amazing audiences like you. So we're going to open this up to questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And hey, Aaron, you're back. Hey, I am. That was great. I, you know, I Thank love you. I love stories, hearing stories about successful um, testing. And I think I think a lot of people don't understand that uh, product designers, user experience designers, interaction designers, when we're designing products for people, we actually do do a lot of uh, quantitative testing. And it's a part of the, the field and the process that doesn't get a lot of exposure, especially these A, B, C, D, mm -hmm. E, F, G tests. Um, I have had the experience of working at large companies as well, where you can run millions of people. Um, so we do have some questions and I'm gonna read you the first one, which is a three-parter. So three parter. Okay, yeah. let's go. We got a three parter. We started uh, so, off strong. <laughs> so Glenn starts out with uh, this is a fascinating field, and he has a few questions. So, how did Netflix come up with the growth goal? That's part one. Generally, what kind of budget goes towards this campaign? And are there times when you would suggest that growth is not a good idea? How did Netflix come up with the growth goal? Glenn, do you mean the 500 million number? If so, then that's more of a lofty idea. It's not a specific time frame of you have to have 500 million by the end of the year or something, but that's just a good milestone to set. That's half a billion people. So of course, we'll hit 300 million before that and 400 million before that. But the bigger next massive goal that the company is going for is 500 million, but I think that's just a pie in the sky number, as opposed to we're definitely just trying to grow the numbers every day, no matter what those numbers are. Um, generally, what kind of budget? I'm fortunate enough to say we we don't have a budget at Netflix for things, and that can be the gift and the curse. We suggest all of you to go to the netflix.com website and read our company memo 
And that's where you see a lot of people get their idea about what working at Netflix is like. One of our company values, our biggest company value is actually freedom and responsibility. So I'm saying all of that to say there is no budget, spend whatever you need, but now don't waste the money. Don't be greedy or anything like that. Use whatever you need to get the job done. So I don't know how much this video costs overall, because when you think there was about 50 people helped do this video. So when you do the man hours of that, it's in the millions of dollars, but nobody was focused on don't go over this budget. But when you can do things like save the money that we saved on a voiceover, it just looks good, but it wasn't a, oh, now because you say this, you can roll over to that. Netflix is a fortunate enough company to have the resources to do whatever we really want to do, honestly. And then last, are there times when you would suggest that growth isn't a good idea? That's a tricky question because I, I kind of understand it, but I kind of don't, but I'm gonna give you my answer. Growth isn't a good idea at the expense of a user. So we do not promote dark patterns. We do not trick users. I'm the first person in the meeting to raise my hand and say, uh, I don't like the way that felt, that you didn't give enough context. You didn't uh, put a confirmation screen. What if somebody's child sat on a remote and, and, and process this payment? Or what if somebody didn't really understand this and we build them anyway? So we're always about UX. So we don't swap UX for growth meaning we won't put out a, a campaign just to pad the numbers if it ultimately resulted in a bad experience for our users. We don't do revenue over brand. Brand is more important than revenue for us. So that's the decision that we have to make as a designer of is the subscriber, is our customer losing right now because we're trying to solve some type of business idea. So I would say Growth should never be important, more important than the user, honestly. Erin? Okay, so we've had a couple more questions come in, but- um, I see them, got, they coming in. Yeah, I've got two from Severo, and so I'm gonna read you the first one and then we'll jump down. Um, mm -hmm. What is the biggest challenge yet that you've tackled with a Netflix product or project? You don't know the right or wrong. There's so much ambiguity at Netflix because we're innovating and because you can do whatever, sometimes it's like, you're just going out into the wild. And a lot of people can't handle that kind of ambiguity because you may be used to structure like that. But I literally don't have a director or somebody telling me what to do. We're all trying to figure this out together. So you have to be confident in yourself and in your team and trust your team in the decisions that you make because you might not know whether it's a right or wrong answer until year, like a year later, because it's gonna take so long to get it built. But we also don't really focus on, is this right or wrong? It's, did, did you do the best you could with the best intentions for Netflix? And however that, ha however that rolls out is how it rolls out. So uh, that's what I would say is the, uh, the trickiest part is that every day it's like you're just jumping into the ocean and you just swim in and you just you just hope you reach land but you reach land you just don't know you're going to reach there but it mm -hmm. also makes the job really exciting at the same time so there's never a dull moment honestly so here's one to um get you thinking um what do you think the future of design will be hmm hope more diverse. I hope a lot more people from different communities in design. And if that's what it is, then I think we're going to see even better, better, even better and better products being built. And you're going to see even better and better design because you're going to see more diverse design from more backgrounds and more perspectives. And that's what you want. That's what design is. It's a form of expression. So I'm hoping that see all of your work and I see all of your friends work and I see everybody's work more and more prevalent in in and throughout design so that's what I hope a more diverse and a more inclusive design where you see more brands and designers caring about the people that will be interacting and viewing and using these products and that's from a 
you care about disability perspective. So now you're no longer even highlighting it as this is because of accessibility or anything. It's just baked into design. So I would say a more diverse and a more inclusive design is what I think is on the horizon. And that's what I'm supporting and pushing for every day. That's great. Thank you. Um, so Rakshid asks, well, first says, hello, Fonz Morris. Thanks for such an amazing lecture. Genuinely so thoughtful and enlightening. I want to ask you about how you perceive the behavioral change and negative mental health outcomes that may be a result of corporate goals. So that capitalism aspect. That's a, that's a really good question. That's, I didn't expect that today, but I actually have a good answer for that. See, I think that goes into company culture. And I, I'm lucky enough to work at a company that even though it's Netflix and it has this uh, persona of being cutthroat and they only hire the best and all of that type of stuff, they just have a really good culture. And because of that, I feel emotionally and psychologically safe at work. So even though we are solving hard problems and my days are so hectic, I still feel like the company has my best interest. We get to do things like quiet August, where we cut almost all of our meetings that are not mandatory. And that's the month where you, you're not necessarily on vacation a whole month, but it's a slow down month for you to take your time, do however you want. Some people take off all Fridays, every Friday. Some people are just like offline the whole month. They're still working, but it's a way for you to kind of recharge because we know that the rest of the year is going to be super busy. We just do there's just a lot of support from the company internally. So it makes me feel like they're not just trying to burn me out. They're doing the best that they can to try to support me. And that's whether it's unlimited vacation, where not necessarily go on vacation for a year, but if you're feeling burnt out and you need time for yourself or your family, please, by all means, go do that. And I think that's the best that a company can do as well as a lot of the other ways that they support us with, with donation matching and things like that to where it helps you fill your cup in other areas that maybe you may get low because you're just designing or you're engineering all day, but then you see them overflowing in other areas. And I think that's how you kind of have that balance. So that balance is what I would say is really important. And that ends up coming from the culture. So like, I know some of you are probably going to be looking for a job soon or in the future. Just really make sure that you know or you do some research on the culture of the organization that you're going to join so that you can be at a place where your values and their culture align. And then that's how you really be happy at work. So we have a, um, a follow up clarification. Um, so she meant she or he oh, okay. um, meant for Netflix user, but these are good insights into the Netflix culture. Oh, uh, hmm. Our question isn't showing up for me anymore. Can can you repeat the first part of the question again for me? Um, it doesn't show up for me anymore either. So. Oh no! Wait. Like, is it answered? It's okay. under answered. Like I see it. Okay, like I want to see how you proceed with it. We change it. Oh yeah, there it is. See that. I mean, we don't try to design anything at Netflix that would ever have any kind of negative effect on people. We're very conscious of our users. We're very conscious on on all of our users where we take a lot of back end precautions to make sure that we are providing the best experience. Like a kid's profile who never see any interventions from us, they'll never see any kind of marketing or or any information from us. We have amazing customer service support to where if something happens and and enough people call into our customer service support, it's going to make it up to the powers that be that can make that decision. So I think I know, I even know of the internal teams that are working on different projects to make sure the things that Netflix roll out doesn't have a negative impact on on our users, as well as even to the next level of, we do things like um, like the the qualitative calls that we have 
are really with our users. Like, so we have the ability to, to put a lot of things in front of them. If we put things in front of our users and, and we're getting that sense that, wait a minute, this is having a super negative response, we're not gonna roll that out. So I think once again, that does go into the culture of the company. Nobody at Netflix is trying to produce anything that would be harmful at all. Now, we don't produce all of the, the content that you see. Some of that content is licensed from people. So some of the, the, the projects that get on Netflix, I can't speak for all of those, but I can speak for my product team. And I can say that we would never build anything that we know would have any kind of negative impact on people because we care because our family watch Netflix, our kids, our mom, our dads, our brothers and sisters. So we're all very conscious about what we're building and we do the best we can every day to provide the best experience for, for everybody, which is a hard job, but we definitely take things like mental health into consideration. So I gave you two answers because I gave you how Netflix helps us as employees, but that's the answer on how we make sure that we put out a good product for our users. That's great. Um, so Severo asked, was there a point where you pushed back on an idea from a team member? And what's your best practice for pushing back? That's a great oh. question for team teamwork. Oh yeah, we push back all day, every day. That's like, I mean, I can tell you, I can tell you that today. <laughs> I pushed back today. I pushed back four times yesterday. We have a very strong feedback environment. So we're looking for feedback from people. Now we want you to have some kind of a thought or something powering your feedback as opposed to, I just don't like this. Okay, that's cool. Can you give us some reasons why you don't like it? Is it missing a mark for what reason so we can build on top of that. So I think at other companies, it, this question would have been, my answer would have been a little more interesting because it wasn't as easy to push back. The teams were smaller, the culture didn't really support that. Where at Netflix, like I said, we're very collaborative, we're very transparent, and you see people push back on things all day. You even see people push back on the, CEO and the chief product officer, because that's how transparent we are, where the last piece I'll say is we are very doc, like Google doc focused and just docs in general. So whether it's tech specs or UX design specs or just documents, but the reason that we create these documents is because we allow them to be shared throughout the company. So everybody's always giving their feedback. So you'll have a a document that's only three pages, but it'll stretch to 20 pages because you have that many comments in it. And a lot of the comments is pushback, but it's not just critiques, it's actually constructive criticism. And you go back and forth to try to get the best decision. So because the culture supports it, it's not hard for us to push back on things, especially if we know as an expert in this area, we have a different opinion. Now, will they always listen to you? that's up to the person that's actually making that decision, but you will be heard. Awesome. And one last question, um, unless people throw some more in the, in the Q and A is, have you ever encountered a time where you've run out of ideas for a certain project? Yeah, for sure. Like, I think that happens all the time. And I think that's where you take a break and you, you just disattach from it. You can either, go for a walk if you need that kind, or you can work with other designers to brainstorm, or you can go back to square one and see if there's something that you missed. Yes, I think we all have creative blocks sometimes, but I love to research. So I get out of it by talking to my peers and just looking at things. I think I get inspiration from various things just in my day that that may spark that fire that I needed to go push through this, or I may read an article, or I may watch a YouTube video, or talk with my daughter, who knows, because design is more of a, like a lifestyle for me, I'm always taking in things. So yes, I have hit creative roadblocks many times. And that's, that's when I feel like maybe I'm thinking about it too much, or I'm working too hard. And that's when I'll just take a step back and, and look at it from a different perspective or 
talk to some people to see if I can get some different insight that may help me get back rolling again. Thank you. I love that you said design is a lifestyle. That's so awesome. Oh yeah, no, like, no, like I live and breathe this <laughs> all day, every day. Well, that was the end of our questions. Thank you so much. It was, it was really, um, really awesome to see like actual stats and and get like behind the scenes of how how you work as a designer and um, how you how you design to reach these business goals. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to thank you for spending your time with us this evening and and sharing your stories. And um, of course, I expect we will have you back looking at some, some giving some feedback on some of our. Oh stories. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now you can put a face to that uh portfolio review you can say oh i remember hey that's the guy from netflix but yeah um aaron thank you for having me tonight thank you everybody for tuning in and that's what i like to do about my talks i really wanted to give a little bit of insight so you can really see what it's like yes yes i want to show you the end product but i want to show you all the things it takes to get to that end product and that's what design really is yep couldn't agree with you more thank you so much thank you